afternoon's webinar. All right, um, so um, I am pleased to emcee this afternoon's webinar regarding alternatives to predatory consumer loans, and I thank you all for taking the time to log on with us today. Uh, in a moment, we will hear insights from remarkable practitioners within the financial ecosystem and learn how some companies are responding to the need for quick, small dollar loans and providing the products consumers need. In January 2021, the Legislative Black Caucus passed four policy pillars aimed at eliminating systemic racism in Illinois. The Economic Access Pillar contained the Predatory Loan Prevention Act, which you will hear referred to as the PLPA quite often if you haven't already, uh, that set a rate cap of 36% APR on consumer loans in this state. <coughs> Excuse me. Predatory loans have drained billions from Black, Brown, and lower income communities in our state, and our last presenter will add greater context to this point. The PLPA has stopped this cycle of disinvestment and enabled our communities to retain wealth and invest in jobs. However, we must remain vigilant in our attempts to eliminate systemic racism. These systems were built and fortified over hundreds of years and won't just disappear into the night. Systemic racism is a financial system that says that Black, Brown, and lower income communities need loans that cost 240% APR or more, while upper income white communities enjoy access to credit at just a small fraction of that cost. We know this to be a fallacy. Families struggling to make ends meet cannot borrow their way to prosperity because borrowing leads to more debt. A 240% pawn loan is not what a struggling family needs and it's not their only option. And today we'll be able to point directly to an ever increasing number of alternatives, many of which don't require more borrowing or taking on more debt. And these truths are what we are here to learn more about today. So before our, I invite our first speaker to unmute, I'd like everyone to keep a pen and paper handy. We have closed the chat during the presentations and then also muted everyone. And we will reopen the chat and allow you to unmute yourself once the final speaker has had his turn to share. So just please jot down your thoughts and questions as they arise so they're easily accessible to you when we have our Q&A time. Now, I am delighted to invite Andy Posner, founder and CEO of Capital Good Fund, to unmute and share. Thank you so much, Amber. Uh, and thank you so much, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, go to the next slide. As Amber said, I'm Andy Posner. I'm the founder and CEO of Capital Good Fund. I'm going to take the next uh, five to seven minutes to tell you a little bit about our work in general, and in particular, the payday alternative style product we offer in Illinois, and then look forward to Q&A at the end. So a little bit about us. I started the organization in 2009. We are a community development financial institution, or CDFI, which is a U.S. Treasury certification. We're based in Rhode Island, and we lend in 10 states, <clears throat> including throughout all of Illinois. We are an online lender, which has the advantage of meaning of um, allowing us to reach anybody within a state in which we're light licensed to lend. Uh, the disadvantage is that we don't see people in person. So it's an online only process, uh, though we've spent a lot of money to make it uh, mobile optimized and accessible to our target market. Um, our mission is to create pathways out of poverty and advance an inclusive green economy. And we do that through uh, sorry, advanced green economy through inclusive financial services, and we do that through small dollar personal loans and financial and health coaching. Next slide. In terms of who we're serving, it's very aligned with, uh, I think, the all of the folks that um, are most in need of the services. So uh, everything we do is bilingual, English, Spanish, native translated. All of our client facing staff are fluent in Spanish. Um, <clears throat> majority of our clients, clients are folks of color, uh, with Black African American being the largest pop percentage, um, and then we have 20, 24% Hispanic. You can see also that the average FICO of our borrowers is 590, and 10% of them don't have a FICO score, and we're very much focused on serving folks that are at 80% of area median income or below, or otherwise lack access to affordable credit from banks, credit unions, and other sources. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, just a little bit about our scale. 
So like I mentioned, we've been around for 14 years. We just crossed 11,000 loans and $27 million financed. We're extraordinarily proud of our 96% plus repayment rate, especially when you consider that typically with a FICO of 590, you would expect much larger losses. Um, we attribute that to the way that we underwrite applications, which I'll get to in a second, as well as our relationship, uh, the relationships that we build with our clients. By virtue of the fact that we report to all three credit bureaus, there's a 75 point average FICO increase. And we estimate we've helped families save $7 million in interest and fees over the years. Next slide. So we offer um, a, a variety of loan products, you know, everything from uh, residential solar and energy efficiency for low-income homeowners to immigration loans for things like citizenship or green card. And then what we're going to talk about now briefly is our payday alternative loan, which in Illinois we call the crisis relief loan. And you know, you can see here the, the, the key points about it, but um, you know, it's a very low interest rate, which is a fixed APR of 5%, 15 month term. We have no application, prepayment, late or closing penalties or fees. Um, relatively quick turnaround. So 48 business hour turnaround time from application to decision. You know, it's not instant. And that's because we underwrite based on you know, cash flow, and credit history, not FICO score, which doesn't lend itself to an algorithmic approach. It is a person taking a quick look, it has to be quick, but still a look. And that is important for allowing us to look past just the traditional metrics of FICO score. <clears throat> the loan can be used for pretty much anything. Most commonly it's rent, utilities, car repair. It used to be paying off high interest debt, although with the PLPA, we don't see as much of that, thankfully. Although uh, pawn tickets are still legal and we do refinance some of those. And then crucially, because we're able to supplement this with grant income, one of the things we can do is that while we don't tell clients this for reasons that'll become clear momentarily, if a customer is at a point when we normally would have to charge off the loan, we will actually be able to forgive it with the grant dollars, which protects both our, both our portfolio and the borrower's credit. So that's allowed us to get capital into people's hands, particularly in the wake of um, the pandemic, but now it's kind of our ongoing model. Next slide. Yeah, so I'll just wrap up by noting that the product is available now and has been for a couple of years throughout the state of Illinois. Folks can apply on our website, capitalgoodfund.org 24 seven. Um, <clears throat> like I said, for, uh, two business day turnaround from application to decision. We fund the, the account, the borrower's account electronically, payments are processed electronically. Um, so it's made meant to be a very simple and efficient process to get money into people's hands cost effectively and uh, in a low stress way. So thank you so much. Look forward to Q and A at the end. Thank you, Andy. Um, now I would like to invite Barbara, I'm sorry, now I welcome Ben LaRocco, Senior Director of Government Relations for Earnin. Thanks, Amber. Hello, all. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, Amber, you can uh, go to the next slide. Um, I work for Earnin, which is an earned wage access company. And the service we provide is allowing people to access their wages once they've earned them rather than waiting until payday. So uh, we've all worked today. We've earned money this morning before this webinar. That money is legally ours. However, our employers are allowed to keep it because payroll is complicated. And rather than paying people daily, uh, they, you know, the law allows them to pay every two weeks or once a month. So that timing harms a lot of people who don't have a lot of liquidity. So we are trying to help that liquidity the problem we are trying to solve is, you know, right before payday, uh, people have, you know, the bill cycle and the payday cycle don't necessarily match up. People have bills due and they end up going into a hole, which allow, which keeps them from starting at, you know, scratch the next week. So they, they end up having to build out from a hole. So um, our average customer has somewhere like $125 in their bank account but $700 in earned but unpaid wages. So when you have that sort of $125 in your bank account, all you're thinking about is how do I get to payday? And so 
you're happy to take that overdraft charge. You're happy to take that like loan that's high cost because you need the money now and you'll worry about the, the fee later. But if you have that full liquidity of both your earnings and your um, bank account, then it's a very different thought process of how you manage your money and how you manage your expenses. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our, our customers, my guess is, is going to be pretty similar to a lot of the other folks, maybe skew a little bit younger uh, because it is an app um, all online. So um, about 68%, 25 to 44, the vast majority make uh, 25 to $75,000 a year and uh, overwhelmingly female. So when I think of, you know, my average customer, this is a mom who has a job, you know, maybe she's um, a manager, a retail store, works in an Amazon warehouse. Um, has some kids, has some unexpected, uh, unexpected expenses that comes up and needs a little bit of, little bit of liquidity every once in a while. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what do people use this for? So we can see people's transactions. So we can see what, um, uh, what they're using our money for. And so, uh, you know, they are basically using it to cover everyday expenses. So I think one, you know, Um, inaccurate uh, explanation is that folks in the in the low income spectrum um, have you know are, are going to be wasteful with their money if they get some money. But what we see is they're very budget friendly or very budget conscious. They know where absolutely every dollar is going, and they really understand how to manage their money. And with earning, they're using it to pay their everyday expenses. Next slide, please. Um, so how does it work? Um, this is what, if you were to download the Earn app, every single one of you could do that right now on your phone, use our service. Um, this is what it looks like to the customer. Um, on the, the screenshot to the left, you can see this person has $300 in earnings that they, they can access. Um, you can access up to $100 per day and $750 per pay period. Of course, if you haven't earned that much, you can't access that much, but that's the maximum you can earn, access. So um, you would hit cash out. Um, choose how much you want to cash out. Um, there's two ways that we make money. Uh, those are the only two ways we make money. One is a fee for an expedited payment. So similar if you're using PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App, the ACH uh, transfer is free. But if you want to use the debit rails and get that money in your account within minutes, uh, there's a small charge, $199 to $399, depending on how much you access. Uh, and we ask people for a voluntary tip. About half of the, trans about half of the transactions have a tip. The average tip is about $2. Um, so many people use this service completely for free. Um, and our average uh, payment per transaction is about 5%. Um, next slide, please. Um, so some of the benefits of using EarnIn and Earned Wage Access. Um, this is available to anybody that has a, a bank account and direct deposit. So if you don't have any credit history whatsoever, if you're a new immigrant and you've never used the, you know, the U.S. financial system before, if you just got out of the justice system and you have no financial data, uh, you can use it. We don't sell any data. There's no mandatory fees, so people can use it for free. And it's non-recourse, so if somebody doesn't pay us back, there's no credit reporting. Um, there's no rollovers. There's no interest. So, you know, if somebody doesn't pay us back $100, they never owe us more than $100. Um, and uh, so it's a very friendly, uh, very friendly consumer product. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, because, so, so this is what it looks like when you actually get the account. So this is the disclosure, um, the amount you got, uh, when you're, when we're going to, um, get repaid on your next paycheck, um, and 24 seven account, uh, uh, customer service. So if you ever have any issues, uh, right there in the app at all times, you can contact us and change that date or um, update us on any any life changes that you have. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, in closing, I, I want to just reiterate, there's no fines, no fees, no interest. Um, so if something happens to you, uh, you know, life happens, financial issues happen, um, you know, earn and takes the loss if somebody doesn't pay us back. So there's no, uh, uh, no, issues with the with the borrower. Um, next slide, please. Uh, thanks a lot.
Thank you, Ben. Now I would like to invite Barbara Martinez, Manager of Asset Building Programs at Heartland Alliance and an accredited financial counselor to present. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, everybody, for having me. I manage the asset building programs at Heartland Alliance, uh, and our asset building programs have three components. Um, it has financial coaching. It has financial education. We require everybody to attend at least five hours of financial education during the program. And it also has asset building. Uh, we try to help them exit with an asset, either through match savings or through direct cash transfers. So today I'm going to talk about the type of participants that uh, we see that can access this pawn shop um, credit. Um, but I just wanted to give you an overview of my participants are low income adults. I have a lot of uh, females that are mothers, but I also have males. Um, they are employed, but usually underemployed. They have tend, tend to have a lot of debt and low income, I'm sorry, low credit scores. Um, some of them have uh, invisible credit, um, so they don't have any credit. Most of them have banking, um, and some of them don't are new to banking, but we encourage them that before they exit the program, they're back. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you and the typical participant that will come to us um, with a need or that have come already with something uh, of like having a, a, a product already uh, submitted to the pawn shop and they're making payments. Um, as a financial coach, we never advise participants to go to pawn shop because we consider them predatory in terms of the amount of interest that they charge for the money they, they lend to participants. So however, a lot of our participants already did it before they started the program or they do it during the program and then later we'll find out about it. So it could be a typical, like Ben said, a mother of three, nice full-time job, um, and pays everything on time, but she don't make enough income to pay all her expenses and debt. So she lives paycheck to paycheck. Her car breaks in the weekend and she needs the car to keep the job so she can keep paying everything on time and, and also to take the kids to school. So this is when she makes a decision to walk in the pawn shop and pawn her mother's ring that is an heirloom, something that she uh, emotionally is attached to uh, with the promise to herself that in 30 days, she will pay the loan back with the interest and recover her mother's heirloom. And if that happened, that would be like the ideal scenario. However, what happens, what tends to happen is that it, they, they are not able to come up with the whole amount they borrow plus the interest that is a lot at the end of the 30 days. So they ask for extension. Uh, and some of the participants have extensions for months and years. And the reason is because they are attached emotionally to that piece of asset that they gave to the pawn shop. And they have the hope that one day maybe their financial situation get better and they're able to pay the loan with all the interest that has accumulated over all that time. And a lot of the time, they actually end up losing the item and never recovering the item. So um, I just wanted to make sure that you understand that these participants never go to the pawn shop for like getting money to do something frivolous. The majority of time, they go to pay rent because they're facing eviction or they are fixing the car so they can keep their jobs. Just like Ben said, that the same reasons that they access their cash advance. Next slide, please. So when we work with participants, we try to find out ways to position them so they never had the need to go to a pawn shop or to help them get out of that situation. We do cash flows with them so they can understand when their expenses and their incomes and how they match and how can they move it so they match and they are better off every month. We also use behavioral economics to try to position them before the emergency happen so they can start building some sort of plan. And some of them can be like a FinTech app that they can download and every transaction they make is rounded up so then they can start a saving account. And maybe they have enough saving when the emergency happened to cover it. We also uh, kind of coach them to open a relationship with a credit union because we know they have better terms than other places and they're open to lending, sometimes even without credit pools. So we, we encourage them to open a saving account and credit union, start making monthly deposits and then eventually learn about the products that they have. And I know, for example, Great Lakes have a great product that a lot of our participants use that is called Cash in a Flash, where they can walk into their credit union and get this $500 without a credit pool. And that is a lot of peace of mind to have, even if you don't need it right now. Next slide, please. 
We also work with participants to make sure that they have access to all the benefits that they qualify for. So then they can like have some of the cash for other things. If they can have benefits covering, for example, food or something like that. We make sure that they claim all their taxes uh, credits, uh, but not only claim them, but also plan on how to use them. So then they can have a reserve for when those emergencies happen. We also make sure that they are adjusting their W-4 so they can have the most money in their pocket. We make sure also that if their income is not enough to kind of like help them figure out what else can they do. Some of them are full-time, they have kids, they cannot have two jobs, but there are things that they can do. And a lot of participants are really creative. Some of them have rent their own car to make extra money. Uh, some of them have sell things in, uh, in apps like Posh and McCarty. We also make sure that they, to uh, put in their head, some employers let you get your cash advance from your salary. Find out if your employer does that. And if not, let's connect you to an app like Earning so you can access your money when you need it rather than walk and paying interest for something that you need. Uh, so that's how we prepare them. We also, next slide please. We also help uh, look at their debt and what can we help them mitigate or help uh, organizing their debt. So for example, student loans, they have sometimes better payment plans for that participant situation. Medical debt, there's charity care. Hospitals have funds to help people that are low income pay for out-of-pocket expenses. Sometimes they don't know that. And then if they are really facing eviction or facing a, a utility disconnection, we know that there are government programs that can help them pay past rent, security deposit for a new place, or even utilities. Next slide, please. So bottom line, what we think is that the uh, predatory lending trap participants into a cycle of debt where they are continuously paying monthly for something that they never going to actually get back in terms of assets. So they have that emotional shame. So we see these places as profiting from participants' desperation in a moment of need and not helping them get out of the poverty that they find themselves in because they are never able to accumulate those assets that they are giving to these predatory lenders and maybe save them or pay debt or invest them. So they're never going to get out of that situation of poverty. So that's why we think that there's also always a better alternative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Now I would like to invite Michael Hirsch, Chief Administrative Officer at Great Lakes Credit Union. To well, thank you, Amber. And thank you for everyone on the webinar for allowing me the time to speak today about the impact of predatory lending. And more importantly, our alternative products and services that are offered by credit unions. And for me, I'm specifically going to be talking about what we offer here at Great Lakes Credit Union. Uh, next slide, please. So before I speak about predatory and pawn lenders, I think it's important to at least introduce uh, Great Lakes Credit Union uh, and tell you a little bit about who we are and how we started. So like all credit unions, GLCU is a non profit, member-owned, democratically controlled financial cooperative governed by a voluntary board of directors. We've been serving a diverse set of members and communities for going on 85 years. Uh, this year, we'll celebrate 85 years. We've helped tens of thousands of people build their financial lives the way they want for themselves. GLCU is about banking for the greater good. Each decision we make empowers our members and communities to use their financials to achieve greatness, no matter who they are. Our legacy actually goes back those 85 years when we started on the Great Lakes Naval Base, serving a diverse membership of civilian workers and enlisted recruits. Once we left the Naval Base, we expanded into serving our communities, and our commitment to give back and empowering our communities is what makes GLCU different from big banks, local banks, community banks, and often even other credit units. Today, we actually are a financial institution with 1.3 billion in assets under control, and we're headquartered here in Bannockburn, Illinois. We have 13 branches across the entire Chicagoland uh, community, and we are committed to financial empowerment for everyone. In 2022, GLC revised our fee structure and eliminated certain fees to save our members an aggregate of more than $1 million annually. Next slide, please. So being in the greater Chicagoland area, we have a diverse community that we serve. As you can see, 51% of GLCU members are low income and we span across all generations. Also, we serve a diverse membership uh, in terms of race and ethnicity. In our Bowling Book branch, 
48% of our members are white, 26% are Hispanic, 19 are African-American, and 13 are Asian. Compare that to our Country Club Hills branch, where 88% of our members are African-American, 9% are white, and three are Hispanic. And just one other comparison, our Waukegan branch, where 53% of our members are Hispanic, 19% are white, and 19 are African-American. Next slide, please. So GLCU is actually proud to be one of only eight credit unions in the nation that happen to offer a HUD certified housing counseling program. And this service is free counseling to anyone in our community. The services that we provide include financial counseling, rental counseling, pre-purchase and post-purchase home ownership, foreclosure intervention counseling, and in-person virtual workshops and seminars. We actually work with Ida today on housing, mortgage assistance, and rental assistance programs through the pandemic. In fiscal year 2022, we served 127 households uh, that received financial education or some level of counseling. We also offered our services and supported over 518 households with different programs that we offered. Next slide, please. So as a low income designated credit union and HUD housing uh, counseling certified program, GLCU has seen firsthand the impact of predatory lending. These programs are targeted for the most financially vulnerable individuals at their most desperate situations. These individuals, many of them don't know or have the time to research alternative options. Once in this financial trap of excessive interest rates on short-term loans, it's difficult for the individuals to break out of the cycle of one of the predatory loans, one after the other after the other, as most of these individuals live paycheck to paycheck, which I think Barbara demonstrated very, very well. Through our housing counseling program, we saw 34 households or 6.56% of the households we served were impacted by predatory lenders. One of GLCU's initiatives is to serve the unbanked and underbanked communities which we participate in. This means we focus on the same low income communities where predatory lenders operate. The Woodstock Institute data shows that in Waukegan alone, one of our larger locations and one of our busiest branches, and we work with many local community partners, individuals took out more than $2.1 million in high interest installment loans in, 19, in 2019. Next slide, please. But there is a difference, there is alternatives. There's a better alternative solution for these community members in need. GLCU developed and offers a wide range of products and services specifically for our members and our communities who may be going through financial hardship or need access of funds and liquidity. In addition to our housing counselings who help put people on the path to financial independence and home ownership, we also offer these products. First, our cash in the flash loan, a small dollar loan designated for GLCU members who need money right away. Members who meet the requirements can access up to $500 for a maximum term of eight months and APR of just 33.5%. Other lenders can now charge upwards to 400% interest on a similar loan. We also offer shared secured and credit builder loans. Members can use the money in their savings accounts as collateral of the loans, and the APR for these loans is as low as 3%. Unsecured loans. Members can borrow up to from $500 to $3,000 with an APR as low as 9.49, and the terms can vary. We also offer a variety of HELOC or home equity line of credits. Homeowners looking for quick cash can access the value of their home through a HELOC. Interest only options are also available for those who qualify. We also offer fresh checking. Those who are looking to build or rebuild financial history and credit and who can access traditional checking accounts, GLC offers the Bank on Certified Fresh Checking Account, a great alternative for cashing your checks at currency exchanges. As a non-for-profit credit union, our focus is to give back to our members. This means we provide the best rates we can. It also means that we do not bring the same income for our loans as predatory lenders. 
We spend as much money as we can on marketing to reach the communities and inform individuals of the great products and services that we can help them with. Unfortunately, predatory lenders' income is significantly higher based on the rates that they can charge. They can afford to advertise more based on this income and it puts them in an unfair advantage at the cost of the consumer. Next slide, please. Since my time is short, I just wanted to stress GLCU and other credit unions in the market offer off alternative and affordable products and services to the community that can fill the need and put individuals in a better financial position. By capping the maximum interest rate for all lenders, not only creates a fair competitive market, but also puts the consumer and our communities in a better financial position. I look forward to being, as, being able to answer any questions you might have at the end of the presentation. Thank you for that information, Michael. Now to present new research that Woodstock will soon release is our research fellow and my former director, Spencer Cowan. Thank you, Amber, and thank you for all of the speakers who've preceded me for telling us what we already know, which is there are good alternatives to predatory loans. My role, next slide, please. My role here is to present data and facts. I was research director now to answer some of the questions that you may have about pawn shop loans. I'm gonna start with a brief description of who borrows from pawn shops. Then I'm gonna compare pawn shop loans with payday loans, which are the kind of cons predatory consumer lending that most closely resembles pawn shop loans. And finally, I'm gonna talk about the history of pawn shop lending in Illinois and the history of rate caps. Next slide, please. The data for the next two slides on pawn shop loans come from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, which is a federal bank regulator. The data on payday loans comes from the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation, IDFBR. Not surprisingly, lower income households are much more likely to borrow from pawn shops than higher income households. Almost half of pawn shop loans go to borrowers with incomes of less than $30,000 and over three quarters to borrowers with incomes below $50,000. So the people who can least afford to pay triple digit interest rates on loans are the ones most likely to be paying triple digit interest rates. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Black and brown households are also much more likely to borrow from pawn shops than white households. One point nine times more likely for black households and 2.4 times as likely for Latino or Latina households. Given what we know about the disparities based on race and ethnicity in the economic market generally, these data are completely consistent with what we might expect. Next slide, please. This slide shows how pawn shop loans now compare with loans for other forms of predatory lending that are now subject to the 36% rate cap under the PLPA. The rates shown for payday, installment payday, and auto title loans are the average rates those lenders charged in 2020, according to IDFPR reports before the PLPA. They are not the maximum rates that the law allowed. The rate for pawn shop loans is the maximum currently allowed because I don't have an actual figure from IDFPR. The industry has provided a data that suggests a lower average, a mere 168%, but I've not been able to verify that figure. Next slide, please. This slide is one of three to show how pay, pawn shop loans compare with payday loans that carry triple digit annual percentage rates for average loans that are in the three to $400 range. So these are small dollar unsecured loans or cash loans. Because pawn shops make so many more loans, 530,000 compared with 92,000 for payday, over five and a half times as many pawn shop loans as payday loans, the cost to consumers in interest and fees that pawn shops charge is much higher than it was for payday loans. 
$2.21.9 million in interest and fees for pawn shop loans compared with $5.4 million for payday loans. But wait, there's more. Next slide, please. The data that we received from pawn shops themselves reported their loans in a different way than IDFPR uses for reporting payday loans. IDFPR reports rollovers of existing payday loans. Actually, they're not rollovers because rollovers are not allowed by law. But it reports loans to the same person to pay off the prior loan as a separate loan which means that the 91,000, not almost 92,000 number and the $35 million in loan amount for payday loans that IDFPR reported includes all payday loans, including those given to the same customer in order to pay off the earlier loan. Not so with the pawn shop loan data. The pawn shops report rollovers of existing loans as extensions. In other words, they don't treat it as if it's a new loan. So they're not included in that $530,000 figure. There were over 1.1 million ex loan extensions. And those are not included in the original count. So the extensions over and above the original 530,000 cost consumers an additional 22.9 million in interest and fees. So together, pawn shop loans and extensions cost borrowers, most of whom are lower income or black or Latino and Latinas, nearly $45 million in interest and fees. Next slide, please. I'm a data person, I like tables. For those of you who prefer graphics to tables, this chart shows how the amount of loans and interest and fees compare between payday and pawn shop loans. Pawn shop loans cost borrowers over eight times as much in interest and fees in 2020 as payday loans did. That's the impact that they're having in pulling money out of the communities, pulling money out of the pockets of low-income households and borrowers of color. Slide nine. Next slide, please. So what about imposing a 36% rate cap on pawn shop loans as the PLPA has done for all other, for all other non-bank consumer loans? Here's a fact. Pawn shops in Illinois operated successfully with a 36% rate cap between 1909 and 1991. That's 82 years. It wasn't until 1991 that pawn shops could charge additional fees above the 3% per month limit that was imposed on them in state law. Pawn shops in Massachusetts operate successfully with a de facto 36% rate cap and in Pennsylvania, with a de jure or 36% rate cap in state law. And in Arkansas, the rate cap is even lower at 17%. And yet in all of those places, pawn shops do operate successfully. If pawn shops could operate successfully in Illinois for 82 years with a 36% rate cap, I'm confident that they can do so today, that they have been allowed to charge up to 243% for the past 25 years is the exception. It's not the way pawn shops have always done business in Illinois. Almost all non-bank consumer lenders in Illinois operate with a 36% rate cap under the PLPA, and there is no reason that pawn shops can't do so as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Spencer. Thank you to all the presenters. And we now open for questions. So I think the chat should be live. Um, I can I will see if you want to raise your hand. Monitor. Feel free to come off mute. Thank you. The chat is now live.
Looks like Representative Guerrero Cuellar has a question. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the presentation. I do have one question. Um, is there a reason at the percentage that was selected as to um, for for this particular bill why it, it why the number is what it is? Is there is there any kind of mathematical reason for it? Someone, want, I imagine there's a number of folks who could take that. Brent, do you want to take that? Thirty-six percent is the as the Military Lending Act's um, standard that is set nationwide that protects active duty military. Uh, I can send you more information on the precise history of it, but in fact, the interest rate cap back in the early 1900s was around six uh, percent, and over the course of time, it got uh, increased to 36 percent. So, in terms of the math, no, I don't know that there is any. Um, great explanation for why mathematically is at 36%. It is just to develop historically to be that number and does currently represent the rate cap for the Military Lending Act, as well as the rate cap in many states and the rate cap in the federal bill that would establish a nationwide rate cap of 36% across the board. Andy, and did you want to chime in on anything else on that? Yeah, I can just say that, you know, I know 36% can sound high. I also can say that just although we're a nonprofit lender, I, I know the economics of doing these loans and, and they are difficult to do. And, you know, we're able to do 5% because we are grant supported. We can reach a segment in the market, but it is a big, there's a big need out there. And so, you know, you could argue maybe it should be 24, maybe 30, but somewhere in that range is, I think, a good compromise between consumer protection and still enabling some scale and innovation. Um, because again, it is just really tough and you do have higher losses and higher transaction costs uh, to do these small loans. And there is a, there is a need, um, you know, especially when you get rid of a, a payday lending. Thank you. And um, Representative Musman has asked, um, is there a range on caps on PAW shops, shops in other states other than the 36% 36 per, 36 cap that is between that and our 240%? And I'm just going to add, because we're talking about the cap a lot, then another question is, since the cap was passed on payday loans last year, has there been a rash on these places closing? But do we know of other states' caps? I'll answer the first question first, that 20% uh, per month, uh, which is the 243% APR, is not the highest, but is on the high end. I believe there are caps that go as high as 30% per month. Um, so there is a range uh, from there. I think 30% is probably the highest. Uh, I see articles that refer to 1%. Oh, we have not, I've not 1% per month. I've not found spe specifically a state that charges 1%, uh, even though there are sources that say they go as low as 1%. So depending on who you ask, they go as high, as low as 1% and as high as 30% per month. I can also just jump in. Uh, in Rhode Island, where we're headquartered, it's 5% per month or 60% uh, for, for PON. And for payday, we have 261% uh, cap. Like in New York, I know it's uh, 4%. Well, and on payday, the payday lenders have closed. They have decided to close, as is the uh, pattern in other states. In other states, uh, when 36% rate caps are uh, imposed, uh, the payday lenders close. So that is that is the pattern that's that's happened in other states, and it's happened here. So I think one of my other questions is. For people to use these online banking tools that you're talking about, right, they need access to the internet, they need devices, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a computer, to use those things. And I think they need a certain amount of, of comfort level with, with doing that. And I guess I'm I'm curious what we what we know about um, our target markets 
savvy with those devices. I mean, traditionally, if we're going to talk about people coming out of a low income neighborhood, did they have a lot of tech in school? Um, you know, do, do they feel comfortable enough using your programs? I guess I'm just curious about that. I can say that I work with a lot of low-income participants that have um, very little knowledge of technology, uh, and they feel a lot of comfort because that's what they saw their mom do, going to the payday lender to get money orders to pay or going to the pawn shop because that's in the community. However, when they start working with a financial coach or with a credit union um, financial person, um, they understand that by continuing that behavior, um, they, they are not going to be uh, achieving the goals that they want because they are leaving a lot of their availability of cash in those places, you know? So the idea is to, to show them if they were bank, how much they will save. If they were having a normal loan, not a predatory, how much they will have in their pocket to do other things. And when they realize that, then they, they become more comfortable because yeah, having an app that you don't know, that you don't trust is a thing. But when you have people like a financial coach telling you that there's not only that option, there's so many other options. You can go and establish a relationship with a credit union. Then they feel like, okay, they can choose between the app or going to the credit union. But the idea is to help them put them in the path of building wealth. So I don't know. Yeah, and I can mention that uh, for uh, Great Lakes Credit Union, all of our products are available both online and in our branches. Uh, so as um, we wanna make sure that it's a consistent experience whichever channel our community or a member prefers to do business with us. We wanna make them as comfortable as possible with our products and services. So even if they come to our branches, our team is trained and we have uh, tablets available in our branches to kind of walk them through and use that technology as they um, can get more and more comfortable. Our housing counselors, uh, to Barbara's point, are going to work with uh, the clients. Uh, they're going to put them online with different uh, potential providers. If uh, Great Lakes Credit Union cannot uh, fill their need, they're going to work with them to give them that education, make them comfortable enough using those tools as well. So if Great Lakes has a physical presence in some areas, I guess my question is, where is that? Are you in the neighborhoods of your target demographic, just like a pawn shop is in the neighborhood of your target demographic? And and I guess my question is, if that's not a place that their family traditionally has walked into, do they just preconceive for themselves that it's not it's not meant for them and they're not even coming in the door? What what does your outreach plan look like? How successful is that in, in their target neighborhoods? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question and probably our, our biggest challenge. So uh, Great Lakes Credit Union, we serve the greater Chicagoland uh, area. Our field of membership are all the counties within the Chicagoland market. Um, I know that other, product, uh, other credit unions across the state offer similar uh, types of loans, short, uh, small dollar uh, loans. Uh, for us, the reach to the community is probably the biggest thing that we focus on. Uh, we've just completed two different focus groups, one for Hispanic market and one for African-American market to understand how do they want to be contacted? What's the best way to communicate? How do we reach them? How do we, what's the products and services that are most in need for them? We operate, as I mentioned before, we are a low income designated um, organization, which means at least 51% of our members um, fall within the low income designation. Uh, we have branches in Zion, in Waukegan, we have branches in Country Club Hills, we have a branch in Bolingbrook, we have a branch um, even as we go further west out in uh, Woodstock. In other areas, there's absolutely a need um, from um, a low income designation where um, pawn shops do operate. Uh, as far as that, that generational uh, use of credit union and understanding that number one that they actually can bank with a credit union is one of kind of our biggest challenges uh, my personal experience i was with um, a regional bank for 17 years before coming into credit union and i myself didn't even understand credit unions well enough and that's kind of one of my missions is to make sure that we spread the word of what a credit union is and that we're there and available uh, to support the communities um, so that is our biggest challenge and where we spend the majority of our marketing dollars 
uh, on is to reach and understanding how to better inform those communities that were there and we have the products and services that absolutely can fulfill their needs. So when you talk about marketing to a low income audience, what are your channels? Are, are you using Facebook posts? Do you have posters in their community, billboards in their community? Are you attending events within their community where you have a physical table and a human being there to say, have you ever thought about banking with a bank instead of a pawn shop? I guess that's part of my question. Yep, sure. You listed a number of neighborhoods that I guess I don't personally associate with a low income reputation. So, I mean, where, where, where are you in, in Harvey? Where are you in Englewood? You know, what, what are you doing to, to target some of these places? Yeah, so um, in your first question, um, the first question about how do we market, we do social media marketing, we do uh, traditional um, uh, billboard ads, uh, but we have a limited marketing dollars. GLCU, our focus really is community outreach. Every single one of our branches is out in the community, working with chambers, working on events, being in the community. We believe that that's a differential. We can't afford to uh, spend the marketing dollars at say Chase, which has a branch probably within a quarter of a mile of every single one of our branches. Uh, we can't just match their marketing dollars. So we believe that the community impact is where we can make a difference, where we can actually be in there. We're actually even now uh, spending more time getting involved with uh, the community colleges and the libraries to be have a presence there and actually exploring different alternatives such as a pop-up or alternative branches within those. As far as our target market, we actually are very close to signing um, a uh, agreement, a partnership with Leaders Network that does work on bringing uh, food, uh, health, medical, and financial um, empowerment and back to the Austin neighborhood in Chicago, which has traditionally been a desert. Uh, we uh, intend and are looking at locations to open a branch within the Austin neighborhood. So as we see these opportunities, we, that's where we're expanding and, and moving into. Thank you. And we had a question about what happens to those consumers who do not have documentation to process applications for a loan. And anyone so GLCU, we do ITIN lending and we do matricular cards for our lending. So we do offer that. Um, that is one of our alternatives and we actually are building that program uh, even with first mortgages. Thank you for that. So the reason I ask is obviously we've all heard in the news that we're getting an influx of migrants coming in from other countries, right? Unfortunately, those migrants don't have consulates here. And their form of government is not necessarily recognized by the U.S. And so there's no identification for them. So they're coming with whatever they have, whether it be a ring, a necklace, a phone, something. So obviously you have described some kind of scenarios too that would require some, you know, unfortunately that they would, you know, have to, for whatever reason, need some kind of access to some kind of funds. So my concern here is that as much as this also there's a lot of education that's also processed with the loans and, and the services that you offer. The other concern is I think we're also missing here too is, is that particular demographic. And my concern is that they're gonna go to a loan shark. They're gonna go somewhere else where it's just gonna be astronomical, where it's not a particular item. They It's not an item, it's, it's a lend. And then here we are where, you know, they're just put in an unfortunate situation. So I'm just trying to, I understand the concern for the pawn shops. At the same time, I also understand the need for the pawn shops. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but I have to be very realistic about those types of scenarios. I have a couple of pawn shops in a little neighboring in my district. Um, and again, especially with COVID, especially with things that happened that there wasn't a sense of security, those pawn shops were utilized a lot um, and they did some people were able to retrieve items, some were not. So I'm just kind of just I want to put it out there too that to understand that there there is a gap here. Um, I don't know what the solution is. I'm not saying that you would be able to offer a solution. I don't know how to work around it when these individuals can't get any kind of form of identification. That's something too that we're I'm trying to we're trying to work on a solution, but at this time they have you know paperwork that they have may be pieces of papers that were issued to them at the border coming in. So it's not a government issued ID, it's just a piece of paper with their information. 
Yeah, I think that's that's a great question. I, I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, because we work a lot with folks who are um, undocumented, although, we, you know, we, we with ITIN lending or any financial institution is still going to have to do their know your customer items. So you make a great point that there are going to be some folks for whom a pawn shop is, is still needed. And I think the point here is that the ad, we're advocating not to eliminate pawn lending, but just to have a 36% cap. And now you might say, well, but if all the pawn, if all the payday lenders closed, isn't that going to happen with pawn shops? And I really don't think that's the case because with um, with a pawn shop, if the person defaults, they can still sell the item. So they're able to make money whether the person pays the interest or they default and they sell the item. Um, and there are lots of states that have thriving pawn shops even when there's a 36% rate cap. Um, so we're just saying we want to uh, bring them in line with the rates that other lenders can charge. If I may add, um, pawn shops did operate successfully in Illinois with a 36% rate cap for 82 years. They, as Andy said, they continue to operate successfully in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Arkansas with 36% or lower rate cap. According to the pawn industry data, about 40% of their revenue come from re retail sales. Now, it may be that, as Andy suggests, they, have, they need to shift slightly their business model to derive more revenue from sales of items and less from high interest rates. But the business model is viable, clearly. It's viable in other states. It was viable here. So it's not like I guess my, the my payday question lender would where be, the only thing they do is make money on loans. Pawn shops have alternative business sources of revenue. If it was viable, why did it ever increase? And why is it only that 36%? And I think you've quoted three states, it's obviously higher at some degree in other states. And, and I know that you've said that they've op operated successfully, but I guess my question is, what is your measure of success? And when did those caps go into place? And did many of those pawn shops close down in the target areas that we would be concerned about? Yes, they may operate, but are they operating in more affluent areas? You, did you did did we see that they reduced the amount of money they were willing to loan on a pond piece and increase the rates at which they would attempt to resell it, which could be difficult for people looking to get a good deal on an item in in another place or looking to get a certain amount of money for the item they're trying to pawn. I didn't look at the locations of pawn shops in Pennsylvania or Massachusetts. I know there are pawn shops in Boston. I grew up there. I know where some of them are. They operate a sound business model. If they didn't operate a sound business model, they would go out of business. That's kind of the essence of capitalism. If you don't make a profit, you don't stay in business. So it can be operated as a profitable business. I don't know whether they can operate and will want to set up in every possible neighborhood. I can't say they do in Massachusetts. I can't say that I know they do in Boston, which has a lot of low income neighborhoods. I know they do in Pennsylvania. I know they operate with a 17% rate cap in Arkansas. So clearly the pawn shop business model can be adapted to operate profitably in an environment with a rate cap of 36% or less. Thank you, Spencer. And I thank you all for your time, just to respect everyone's time. I encourage you to continue this conversation, getting people's contact information or getting their names and finding them. Um, but just to wrap up, currently the PLPA and the economic pillar are under attack. So allowing prom brokers or any consumer lender to charge 240% APR is a devastating loophole that could cause the whole foundation of the pillar to collapse. We thank you for taking the time to be here with us today as we discredit the argument that predatory consumer loans like high interest um, interest rate pawn loans are the only options for struggling families. The healthy alternatives presented this afternoon are very encouraging and even more products are becoming available to safely meet consumers' needs where they are in place and time. 
We'll send the slides after the rest of uh, this webinar. So please share what you've learned today and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you for being here.